Hey, welcome to our little one hour review. This is this is going to be really fun tonight because uh, this is going to be surprisingly similar to what you're going to be seeing someday when you are sweating your they have perspiration on your brow and you're sitting in front of a computer trying to figure things out. But um, in the Utah law portion of the test, you're going to be given a Rep C contract. It, it's going to be on the computer screen. I mean, you can flip back and forth between the questions and the Rep C. Um, but it's um, you're going to be questioned about this six page Rep C addendum or a Rep C contract plus the addendums. And uh, so tonight, we've our review will be going through this filled out Rep C. So uh, for those of you that uh, don't have one in front of you, it would be very helpful if you would pull it up in your manuals or uh, as as we go through this, because what what's going to happen when you go to the test is you'll be given a question and It'd be very helpful for you if you knew approximately where to find that in these six pages, because your anxiety is going to be increased dramatically if you have to constantly look through the Repsi each time. Now, I understand that you're not going to be a Repsi expert by reading it, or Repsi, of course, stands for the real estate purchase contract, but you're not becoming an expert just by reading it once or twice. But but um, it's important that you just don't freak out on that because in, in truthfulness, what's going to happen is that they're, they're giving you a question, but then they're giving you a crib sheet that has the answers on it. So not only do you not have to recognize it, which would be extremely helpful, but you, you can find the answer on Repsi if you can kind of figure out where it is on the form. And, and you, you don't have time to reread the whole thing each time. So another thing that's really cool about the Rep C is that for each section of this pro, of this contract, the section header is in is in a uh, little bolder print, and it's in all caps. So if you want information on uh, perhaps water, you can go right to section one dot four, and it says water service. You have a question on the purchase price where you'd see how much earnest money there is. You can go to a section 2.1, or you can also look at the top where you have the earnest money deposit as well. Now, be, be, be careful though, because sometimes, and we'll see this tonight, an offer is made and a seller says, well, you know, I like this offer, but I just want a little bit more or I want to change this or I want to change that. You know, they're asking for my refrigerator and I don't want to give it to them or maybe that'd be OK. But they want the washer and dryer <laughs> and they want my uh, teenage daughter as an indentured servant for three years. <laughs> maybe that wouldn't be so bad. I don't know. But anyway, the point is, is you have a crib sheet. You have an answer sheet in front of you. And so we're going to dig right into it. So. We're going to start out with the very first question tonight, which is, uh, what is the settlement deadline? What is the settlement deadline? Okay. Now, the deadlines on this contract would be on page six. Okay. And so let's all flip to page six, please. And we're going to take a look at that. Mine's sticking together. Um, and then... Uh, you see on page six that there's a series of deadlines under section 24. But you know what? If you look down a little bit further, it says acceptance slash counteroffer rejection. And this is all on page six. And look down there underneath where it says acceptance, counteroffer, rejection. Now, was this contract accepted the way it was? Or is there a counterproposal? And you see counterproposal is checked which means that the something got changed on this contract. And in order to figure out what that is, we need to go to the addendum. And the addendum is the seventh page. So on the seventh page, uh, there's going to be a counteroffer. And on that counteroffer, 
it's going to tell us what the change was, all right? So the question, once again, is what is a settlement deadline? And looking at the look, looking at the the uh, counter proposal, which I don't see here. Um, ah, here it is. Okay, addendum number one. There are some things that were changed. Okay, we have uh, items that were included or excluded. We have items for the sale of property, including basketball standard. We have due diligence deadline will be ten days after acceptance. Settlement deadline will be the tenth of August. Oh, okay, right. So it says. What is the settlement deadline? Well, in the offer, they wanted to settle this out on uh, the 19th of July, okay? But that was changed with the addendum. Now, do you think a devious exam writer would have one of the four answers, be it A, B, C, or D? And that answer would be, would be uh, what the contract said? Well, when I mean contract, I mean in the six pages. Oh, here it is. Settlement deadline, July 19th. Oh, boy, that wasn't so hard. And you check that. And guess what? You just missed a question. Because if you notice again, it wasn't accepted as presented. There was a counteroffer. And the counteroffer changed terms in the agreement. So you we go to the addendum number one. And at the top of that, it says... Real estate addendum number one to real estate purchase contract. This is a counter offer, okay? That was referenced on the the nineteenth of June, so it's this contract. And then there are several things that were changed, including uh, the uh, uh, due diligence deadline and the settlement deadline, okay? And right there, this counter proposal says settlement deadline will be August tenth. So that would be the real answer. Not what the buyer wanted, but what the buyer and seller agreed to because the uh, seller wanted to, uh, a change. And they want, looks like they want a little bit more time to get out. Uh, perhaps, I don't know, maybe a little less time uh, on the one that you may be seeing. But watch for those changes because this uh, addendum, number one, is a counter offer. And this is what the buyer and seller agreed to. And if there was a change here, that would be the correct answer. So the correct answer for this is, hit the button, please. Survey says it is uh, right there, okay, where the arrow is, okay? And it will be due diligence deadline. Answer is August 10th, okay? Cool. All right, next question, please. The next question is... Hey, hope you're enjoying the video. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss any more of them. And if you want even more review material, we have in the Prep My Exam link in the comments, we've got a plethora of practice exams. We have audiobooks. We have an exam simulator. We have everything that our students use to pass the exam on their first try. Okay? And if you want to get licensed in Utah, check out realestateonlinelearning.com and we'll hook you up. Is refrigerator included with this? Okay, now this is a quick one because... The inclusions are on the first page, okay? And that's 1.1. 1 .1. And it says, here are all the things that are included. And then it has other inclusions. And then it has, uh, uh, and, and then it has uh, included items. And then it has excluded items. But those blanks aren't really filled in very much. So let's go back to the addendum again. Ah, okay. Because the addendum was a counter proposal, and the sellers would got to think and says, "Well, that was kind of vague, and you know the printed contract had some stuff in it, but um, I want to be very clear, and uh, so let's uh, let's put that in an addendum, okay? So if you look at the addendum, it says that items excluded from the sale of the property include dryer, freezer gas grill, barbecue, and the main level, refrigerator and washer. Now, sometimes people have an old refrigerator in the garage or something. And uh, I guess if they wanted that one, they would leave that one for them. But probably what they're talking about here is, you know, which what's really included uh, was the nice refrigerator, you know, the new one they bought, you know, hopefully not too long ago. Uh, 
And so we want to know, is it included or not? Well, clearly here in the addendum, it's excluded. Okay. So the answer is no, you don't get the fridge. Okay. Okay. Hit the button. No, we don't get the fridge. And that's on the addendum number one, right there where it's yellow highlighted. Okay. See, you can do this. But I don't want you to be freaked out on how long it takes. So the more familiar you are with, with where things might be, the better off you are. So one of the things I would read before starting in on the questions is I would look to see if there's an addendum. Because this was the final word. This was the final agreement between the people. And devious exam writers are going to put one thing in the contract, the main body of the contract. And they're going to change it on a counteroffer. Now, a counteroffer, as you know, is a rejection of the offer. Well, I won't do that, but I will do this. And so that is the final say. And that is the agreement that we had. And you look at this counteroffer. Yes, it was signed by both the seller and the buyer. Okay. So the buyer hereby accepts, accepts, accepts the terms of this uh, addendum. And that is the final word. This is the final. Uh, thing that's going to be judging uh, how things are divided up and whatever else. Okay, let's look at our next question. When was the REPC accepted? When was it accepted? Was it accepted when it was presented? No, it was counteroffered. Well, how do we know? It, well, because there's a counteroffer form that was attached to the agreement. And when you hand these into your broker, they want every single document that went with this uh, transaction, particularly on the buy-sell agreement, which is which we call the real estate purchase contract, and all the addendums. Sometimes there'll be a number of addendums, uh, much more than just one, particularly if you're doing FHA or VA, because they have their own special forms for that as well. But don't be turning into a contract for your broker that has uh, the Rep C contract, and then you see it was countered, and then you have uh, addendum number one, addendum number three, four, and five. <laughs> Someone's going to say, where the heck is addendum number two? Okay. They want the whole thing. And the addendums have to be numbered sequentially. Uh, so anyway, so when was it accepted? Well, would it be on the REPC itself or would it be on the counterproposal? The final acceptance would be on the counterproposal. So going back to addendum number one, once again, we look at that and we see that this was signed uh, by the buyer now, you know, because the seller said, no, I won't do that, but I will do this. And the buyer says, you know, that'll work. Let's do that. It was 6-22-2022. Lots of twos in there. 6-22-2022. So that is the answer, June 22nd, 2022. Okay. You can do this. Someone gave you an answer sheet, <laughs> but but you don't want to take an hour or so to do this. I mean, you know, you should you should move through these as quickly as you can. But don't be suckered on just going with the what the the you know the repsy the you know the six page repsy says, particularly if it was checked that there was a counter proposal, because that means pro something got changed. Won't do that, but I will do this. Okay, let's look at the next question. Who represents the buyer? Who represents the buyer? Well, good. I mean, uh, what we're looking at here is, well, gosh, is that on the first page? No. Well, no. All right. Let's look on the second page. Ah, and look at the bottom of the second page. It says confirmation of agency disclosure. Okay. And on this confirmation of agency. Now, please understand, this is not a buyer and seller disclosure, okay, an agency disclosure. What this is is a confirmation of an agency disclosure. It, you know, you should have a previous document that was signed by your buyer uh, before you even took them out to show them homes, maybe, <clears throat> or that's you know whatever your broker tells you to do. It could I like to get one early on, even before I start working with them. Uh, and, and putting them in my car, but uh, you know, you do what your broker tells you to do. Uh, but our question is, who represents the buyer? Well, looking under confirmation of agency disclosure, uh, 
which your agency contracts, be it listing of a buyer or a seller, buyer's listing, buyer's representation agreement, or a seller's listing, whatever form they take, and there's various forms that they can take. We look on here, we see buyer's agents, my O buyer represents the buyer, and the buyer's legit agency is the brokerage. Well, this question wants to know who represents. Well, would it be the broker or would it be the buyer? Well, it depends on what your answers to the question are. They wouldn't have both the agent and the brokerage, but really all listings, be it buyer's listing or uh, seller's listing, they belong to the broker. So you'll be represented by the broker and the buyer. So you gotta be careful, but, but they wouldn't have both answers there. They would only have one. So uh, buyer's legit agency, perhaps? Well, let's look and see. My old buyer. In this case, they put who represents the buyer as the uh, agent. Okay. And that's okay, you know, because truly the agent represents the buyer through their broker. So they wouldn't have both broker and buyer, but they're going to have one of the two. And then you move on to the next question. Don't agonizing the over these things once you found out the answer. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Let's look. Let's let's look at another question here, and that is: Is the seller representation a limited agent? Is the seller representation a limited agent? Well, a limited agent is someone that's representing both the buyer and the seller. Okay. A designated agent only represents either the buyer or the seller. Okay. Uh, okay. And um, what's going to govern all this? Well, previous contracts and other relationships. If, if you were selling your own listing and a buyer came to maybe an open house you had, or maybe they responded to some other advertisement you had on that particular listing, uh, or maybe you were smart and actually did door knocking in the area where your your listing was. You know, I mean, National Association of Realtors have studied this forever, and they found that if you have a listing, another listing is popping up within 17, maybe 20 days after your listing. In other words, neighborhoods tend to go through cycles. And if people are moving out of that area because they're empty nesters or they need bigger homes because they were starter homes or whatever, uh, one good source of, of more business is to market your listing to people in that area. Because another thing that happens quite often is that somebody that's living in that area wants their mother, brother-in-law, buddy from work to live near them. And they tell them about it. And then that person comes to your open house and... Uh, you know, because the you sent out an invitation not only to um, the buyers you're working with, and but you also sent out in other agents in your area that are working that area, but you also sent out one to all the property owners as well. Hey, drop by and you know I'd like to get acquainted with you. And uh, they they recommend someone or they told someone about the open house and they came. They're not represented by an agent, so now you have a choice. You can represent. The, your seller only, okay, or you could represent the seller and the buyer as a limited agent. But but the question is, is the seller represented? Is the seller representation a limited agent? Well, look at six. You got two different firms here. You got seller brokerage, sellers RS, and buyers brokerage, buyers legit agency. So there's two different brokers and there's two different agents. There's I sell and, and they're the other the other agent is my old buyer. Okay. So uh is it so is it a limited agency? No, it's single agency, isn't it? No, they only represent the seller. Okay. Only represent the seller. Okay, see, because it would be the same company and the same agent, perhaps, you know, in order to be a limited agent all the way through. Okay, I hope you're getting the hang of this. You know, we're going to go back to the crib sheet each and every time. So hopefully you've got, you know, that uh, Rep C contract in front of you as we're going through all this. So let's go to the next question, please.
Okay, our next question is who pays for the special assessments? Okay, well, you know, we're here on page two already. And uh, if you just roll your eyes up a little bit, my goodness, 4.2, special assessments. <laughs> Guys, are you getting the hang of this? Here's your answer sheet. It says special assessments. Any assessments for capital improvements that's approved by the homeowner association, blah, blah, blah. You know, as assessed by municipality or special improvement district, blah, blah, blah. Prior to the settlement demo should be paid for by who? Plain as day. Who's paying for the special assessments? The seller. Ah, but wait, wait. Didn't we have a counterproposal here? Oh my gosh. We better double check our counterproposal, right? The counterproposal. Actually, this will be easier for you because <laughs> you'll have it. Um, it says under 4.2. Okay, special assessments, uh, that who pays for it? Well, it's the seller, okay? Very common. Now, well, could it be negotiated? Well, yeah, look at your contract. It says on 4.2, it says that it could be the seller, the buyer, or split equally, or others. Somebody else can pay for it. Oh, let's have the agent pay for it. Yeah, well, no, don't have, don't offer that. But anyway, it, it, could, it can happen any way. I mean, a number of different ways. How do we know what did happen? By checking that and also looking at our addendum and making sure there is no change there. Okay. Ah, my All right. An addendum says items excluded, items included, due diligence, deadline, settlement deadline. Nope, that's it, just those four things. Okay, next question, please. We whip right through these. It was the seller pays for it. When can the buyer take possession? Okay. Well, hey, look at look at page two again, because there's a whole section that talks about it's three point three that talks about possession, and we can highlight that. And uh, in three three, it says uh, we're talking about possession. It says except as provided in section six one, a and b. This says upon recording. However, we need to check our addendum again. Let me see, items excluded, no, no. Items included, no, no, no. Due diligence, 10 days, at settlement deadline, the 10th. Okay, so the possession will be, as it stated uh, right here on 3.3, upon recording. Recording is when it's finalized. Uh, you know, the, everything's been signed. The money's been sent in to the uh, title company, uh, not only from uh, the, the buyer's down payment and whatnot, but also from the lender, if there is one, and uh, on reporting, okay? So sometimes uh, that means the seller's already out of the house, you know, because they got to get possession right when they come in and sign the documents. You know, you need you need to know what the tradition in the in the, customs are in your particular area uh it's this is not unusual to see something on on recording but on the other hand uh sometimes uh a seller will say well i'm not moving out of the house till i have the money sometimes the seller needs the money in order to rent u-hauls and or a moving company or other people and so it might be one or two days after recording um if it's going to be a long time after recording, that's going to have to be negotiated as well. And we have some uh, amendatory language that you should use. Don't just make something up. We have some language that was uh, has been written by and approved by the the division and the AGs to, uh, in our attorney general's uh, department as well. And it's uh, these these standardized clauses are are the verbiage you should use for that type of thing if you need that. All right, let's look at our next question, please. Moving right along. Our next question is how much earnest money? Well, heck, that was right at the top of the first page, wasn't it? Okay, so let's go back to the first page. And it says on the offer that that the that the earnest money was going to be four thousand dollars. Now, this is something that's commonly changed. So let's let's look at our addendum again. Let me see. Look, looking at our addendum number one, 
You see items excluded, items for sale, basketball swing, deadline, and settle. Nope. No change on that. So how much was the earnest money, folks? What did it say, guys? It said it was four thousand dollars. Right there in the first paragraph. You notice how I'm always checking the addendum? That's just to make double sure. It only takes a couple extra seconds to make double sure. Now, those of you that you know aren't flustered, those of you that are professional test takers, <laughs> you've already memorized what's on this addendum. You know, hey, more power to you. But it doesn't hurt just to take one more quick look to make sure you're absolutely certain. Most people that fail the exam and have to take it again only miss by one or two questions, okay? Uh, so being thorough and, and checking again is what I suggest you, you do. Uh, but, you know, if you got a great memory, you've probably already memorized what's on that addendum already just by looking at it a couple of times. Let's go to the next question, please. Are you having fun yet? I hope so because this is going to be a major part of your test, okay? Now, it's only under Utah law, obviously. What's the tax ID number of the property? Okay, well, let's see here. Let's uh, let's go take a look, all right? Um, let's go to the first page, because that's the page that identifies the buyer and the seller. It's also the page that under under section one, right there at the, the top, the very first section, identifies the address of the property in the county that it's in and the a zip code, but it also says tax ID number. And it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You know, that obviously is just for illustration purposes. But there is a line right there that has a tax ID number in it. Now if and when you join the Board of Realtors and have access to the MLS to uh, enhance your career, which I'd say 99.9% .9 of the agents do, particularly if you want to sell residential real estate, uh, I mean, that's where you find out about the listings, is uh, that's one of the inclusion in the listing uh, identification section for that particular property. It's right there in the MLS. So that's not something you have to look up. It'll be right there and, and you can uh, depend on the fact that, that that's accurate because you know we get in trouble if they're not accurate. So, so agents are really careful about that. Okay, cool. So that was a tax ID number. All righty. Um, all right, let's, let's do the next one, uh, which is, The buyer finds a leaking roof and wants to cancel on July 6th, okay? The buyer finds a leaking roof and wants to cancel on July 6th, can they? Well, they can cancel a contract, um, but but the real question here behind this is what what's gonna happen to the earnest money, you know? I mean, Let's take a look because what we're going to find, what we're going to find is that there is a period of time in which you can do due diligence. And if you look at that, um, we've got confirmation and disclosure, title insurance. You know, I'm looking really quickly, seller disclosures, buyer's conditions. On the third page of the Rep C, you see buyer's conditions of purchase, okay? Because we're talking about a buyer here. And there's some due diligence items, right? And you go through here and, and it says, it is conditioned upon that, all right? So sometimes people say, well, I don't, I don't really need uh, to do any due diligence. You know, uh, I wanna make my offer really strong. I, now I think it's a mistake for people to do that, but, Maybe they've already checked out the property and other being before they made them offer or something. I don't know. Maybe it's just a piece of vacant property that was easy to check out. And, uh, you know, they don't have any improvements to worry about and that type of thing. But whatever the reason is, um, this one is conditioned upon the due diligence. Okay. 
Okay, and so we we continue on on this, and uh, we see on the last page of the Rep C, we have some deadlines. So on this last page, it talks about disclosure deadline when the seller needs to give you all this information about the house. And here we are on B, I'm, I'm on section 24C, appraisal, well, no, uh, C is the appraisal deadline. B is the, 24B is a due diligence deadline. And it says that the, that deadline is uh, July 7th and they're canceling on July 6th. So they wanna cancel, can they? And the, without penalty, and the answer is yes, they can, because they had till the seventh. Now, um, when you're looking at this, was there a change on that on the addendum? We look at the addendum, and it says, uh, "Let me see, items included in the sale." Okay, items included in the sale, property basketball season. Okay. A due diligence deadline will be 10 days after acceptance. Whoa, wait a second. When was this offer accepted again? See, the addendum modified that. That's why I've been looking at the addendum each time. So see, we almost missed a question here because the due diligence deadline, if it is 10 days after acceptance, okay, then uh, it was accepted on the June 23rd, and so that means, uh, man, we don't have until July, you know, seventh anymore. They move that up. So the answer to this is, guess what, folks? No. If you do the math on that deadline of ten days, the deadline ended July second. Not what is said in the face of the contract, which is, you know, was uh, the sixth or the seventh, the seventh. So, gosh. Uh -oh. Now, um, this is something I think that, uh, you know, we, we will, of course, when the addend when the counteroffer was given to your buyer, you sat down and you went through all this with them, okay? Um, and, of course, they got a copy of everything as well. But I think for your own peace of mind and safety, it would be good to send them a confirmation of these changes. And, and it doesn't have to be sounding real legalized and formula, you know, in, in, uh, put together that way. It can be kind of almost chatty and say, well, hey, Mr. Miss Spire, we, I'm so excited you got this contract under, uh, accepted with the counter proposal. And uh, here's some modifications. And I want you to mark this on your calendar but, and then you go through the deadlines for them. And once again, the things that changed, uh, for example, you know, they're, you know, the, the seller is gonna include the, the dryer, freezer, barbecue, drill, uh, gas drill, uh, the main level washer and dryer, uh, refrigerator and washer. And, well, no, those are excluded items, excuse me, but items included in the sale are the basketball standard ceiling fan range and storage unit, storage shed, and your due diligence deadline will be 10 days after the acceptance, which is July 2nd. And the settlement deadline will be August 10th, okay? Um, now, why do I say put this in an email? Because in emails, emails are admissible in court. Now, don't do it with the text because texts haven't been adjudicated and they're not as trackable as an email is. So uh, do it with an email and um, that'll cover you. Because if they're just reading their contract and, you know, and they're not familiar with the uh, things as, as much as we are, you know, that addendum can change everything. They could get confused. Well, I thought we had until it no. Remember they changed that. And then remember I sent you an email reiterating that <laughs> because you're going to explain it to them when you when you give them the counter proposal. But they're going to have something, a, a malady strike them, and it's called selective memory loss. <laughs> His selective memory loss is, well, I don't remember you saying that. I don't, I don't see that at all. Well, no, it was on the agreement. You know, but, well, you know, you should, have, you should have emphasized that to us. And who knows? A judge might agree with them, and they may not. But you don't, you don't even want to go there. So if you have the email, that gives you more ammunition. Okay, enough said on that. Let's go to the next question, please. 
Okay, the next question talks about settlement hasn't happened yet, and it is now the 31st. Ooh, ooh, who's in default? Well, let's go back to that addendum again, addendum number one, because on this addendum number one, it put the settlement deadline will be August 10th. June, July, August, September. Hmm. Addendum number one modified section 24. 24 is where we had all our deadlines, right? And 24 said that um, the settlement deadline would be the 19th. Okay. But then the addendum said, no, wait a minute. We're going to move that settlement deadline. Settlement deadline would be August 10th. So is anybody in default? Well, I don't know. What do you think? June, July, August, July 31st. But wait a minute. We modified it. The closing will be the, the 10th. Now, who requested the 10th? Well, the buyer requested, you know, an earlier date. But the seller said, uh, because, you know, well, let's, let's, let's go back and take another look. Yeah. The buyer requested the settlement deadline to be July 19th. But the seller said, well, wait a minute. Uh, we need more time to get out of the house. Or we need more time to close on the other house we're moving into so that we can actually just, you know, uh, make, make a smoother transition for us. And the buyer said, yeah, okay, I'll work with that. So that's what happened, okay? So that was modified. So it hasn't happened. Is anybody in default? Well, let's take, take a look. What do you think, guys? I mean, it's before August 10th. No, no one. Deadline's August 10th now, right? Always check out the addendums. And, you know, you have so much to worry about. I know, I know um, we have a lot of intelligent people getting into real estate. And, you know, quite frankly, how well you do on the exam, as long as you pass it, is fine. You know, and, and I know a lot of you super achievers, you know, who've already memorized the addendum are going to say, well, you know, I think I got a 98 or I got 100%. Well, you know what? I'm sorry to disappoint you, but they're not going to tell you what your score is. They're just going to say you passed. That's going to upset you. Well, I want to know how well I did. <laughs> it doesn't really make any difference because this is just to get a license. Your real test is how well are you going to do in the business? <laughs> and, and we have a, another whole uh, set of things that we could talk about, but not for the test. It's for how to pass the real test was, are you successful in real estate? I mean, in order to check that out, you've got to get a license. So that's what we're working on now. I love working with you guys. And, you know, I want you to understand that both Dan and I, or Danny and I are available even after you've passed the tests at our school. And, uh, you know, we, we'll be happy to answer any of your questions. I mean, there are different places where you can go to get help with your contracts. Number one is your sales manager. Number two would be your broker. You know, most brokers have sales managers. Some brokers are their own sales manager. But, you know, you, you go to your higher up. You go to the one that's responsible for you. Some people will be working on teams and your team leader, is, you know, will, will help you with some of these questions as well. But uh, no one wants you to fail. Now, we also have a helpline uh, for the state association that you can call if you're a member. And we have someone that mans those phones quite regularly that can also answer questions for you as well. So a lot of places where you can go. And of course, you can call the division if you want to. All right, let's look at the next page, please. Or the next question, please. Can this contract be emailed well i don't know you know i mean let's look uh, on the very last page six of six and it says okay that uh in section 22 page six that electronic transmission and counterparts now counterparts means that you have one contract that the seller spouses um have signed but you find out through the title commitment that it was not just the uh, the husband and wife that owned the property. The uh, mother-in-law had an interest in it as well. So all owners have to sign, okay? But it also says here on 22 that uh, it could be executed in counterparts. 
So if mother-in-law lives in a different state, you know, you may send a, a copy to her. She signs it, sends it back. And then the, the, uh, the other two are living in the house and they're local and they sign it. So you don't have one contract that has everybody's signature on it, but you have the same exact contract with two of the owners and then the third owner signed the other one. That's counterparts. But it also says here that electronic transmission is okay too. Okay. So your answer is what? Can it be emailed? Sure. Right? Says so. Survey says. Of course it can. Why? Because the contract agreed to it. This is not this is not state law. Rules of the real estate division wouldn't govern this either. It's the agreement between the parties. And this clearly says, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, all right, let's look at our next question, please. Are you having fun yet? I hope so. Okay. On June 22nd, is this contract fully executed, executory, or voidable? Which one? Executed means it's all finished. Was it all finished on June 22nd? Well, not particularly. June 22nd, uh, it, it, you know, it was, uh, uh, that's when the buyer signed it. But has it closed yet? No. On June 22nd, it became executory. But is it finished? No. And is it voidable? No. Okay. So, uh, no. I mean, voidable without, without, you know, any penalties or anything? No. Because you're, you, you know, you're, 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 you're moving past some of the deadlines. I mean, look, look at all our deadlines. Now we've changed some of these deadlines, but um, it's executory because that's when they agreed to it. Okay, so at twenty four on the addendum, it says uh, items exempted, items included, due diligence ten days, settlement deadline we August tenth. And that is uh, August 10th is later than on June 22nd. It is, it is in the executory stage. Next question, please. Okay, on June 12th at 5.30 p.m., the buyer still hasn't gotten approval from the underwriter. Can they cancel a contract? Well, let's look at our uh, financing and appraisal deadline is June 12th. Ooh, my gosh. You know, when we're talking about deadlines, if you look up at 21, it says time is of the essence. It's not midnight, uh, boys and girls. It is 5 p.m., okay, unless you change that. Okay, so ugh, you're a little bit late. Should have canceled before 5 o'clock p.m. Ooh, that's, that's a hard one. Next question, please. Okay. We want to know on on uh, are the solar panels included? Well, solar panels. Hmm. Let's look at the inclusions again. Well, first we'll start with the addendum. It says items included in the sale include the basketball standard ceiling fan, range, and storage shed. Doesn't say anything about solar panels. Okay. Sometimes you think, well, if it's permanently attached, well, maybe it is. Well, but you know what? To be very careful about it, I would put it in the contract, wouldn't you? Do you want to buy solar panels for someone? <laughs> you know, I, I've been criticized for being like overstated on things, particularly on tough sheds. Some tough sheds folks are, uh, you know, they're on skids and others are on permanent foundations. Well, it could be the same thing on solar panels. You know, the solar panels could be mounted, not on the house, but on some sort of a temporary type structure. So, uh, Let's look and see where we could find all this, if they're included or not. Well, it says right here on the addendum what's included, right? But it also says in section 1.1, other things are included. And it says, you know, unless it's not excluded, they're included. Um, look at that right there in the second sentence, solar panels. So are they exempted? Well, let's look at the addendum again. Well, it had included items, but it didn't exempt it. Except in the first part, it says items excluded are washer, dryer, grass grill, and main level refrigerator. Didn't say anything about solar panels. So what do you think, guys? Are they included or not? Survey says, give us the answer there. 
not specified, so I guess they are, right? Because it was printed in the contract, but they weren't specifically exempted out. Ooh, people might be very upset by this. You got to be very clear with people what they're getting, what they're not getting. All righty, we've got a couple more here. Well, actually, there's one more, and that is what happens to the original offer on 6-19-22 when the seller signed the counteroffer? What happened? Well, several things happened on this counteroffer. We changed the, well, we changed, changed the due diligence to 10 days after acceptance. We defined the settlement date as August 11th, and we went very carefully through what's included and what's excluded, okay? So that addendum changed a lot of the printed information. But if there's printed information that wasn't changed, well, you know, because it was a counter proposal, guys, it changes your deal. Okay, so the original offer was canceled and it was changed with a counter proposal. Okay, in other words, it changed some of the terms of the original contract. Well, been fun being with you tonight. Uh, make sure you read that Repsy a couple of times and don't hesitate to call. Dan, you want to throw up my phone number? This is Rick Roller signing off. And it is Rick Roller at 801 556 8000. That's 801 556 8000. And of course, you have the school numbers and we're happy to help you any way that we can. Thanks for being with us tonight, folks. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you want to show some appreciation to our instructors, be sure to like and subscribe so that they see how much you've enjoyed it. And if you want any additional review material, check the links below for our full suite of practice materials for the real estate license exam. Thank you.